Hello, welcome to this week's video where we are going to be exploring how integrating the shadow can enhance creativity, embracing the darker aspects of our psyche or unlived parts of self, um, and how these can lead to profound artistic growth. The concept of the shadow, as I've said many times, comes from Carl Jung's analytical psychology, referring to the parts of ourselves that uh, we reject or deny or are and in effect can be unlived. The shadow um, in artistic expression is the first thing I'm gonna look at. And I think lots of people can relate to this. There's been so many famous artists that have delved into their shadow side, using their work to explore themes of darkness, struggle, transformation, pain, all of that stuff. Because the shadow contains our repressed desires, fears, and aspects of our personality, which we relegate and we don't want to know about. Uh, because we consider them undesirable aspects or we don't allow ourselves to be a certain way. And by integrating these aspects into self, not only artists, but everybody can access deeper layers of uh, their subconscious, enriching your creative expression, and not only that, but enriching your emotional well-being and increasing your emotional health. I'll give you a couple of examples, like, uh, I'm trying to think of an artist, uh, Frida Kahlo, I think that's how you pronounce her last name. Her paintings vividly depict her pain and suffering and transform uh, that into powerful art. Her use of vivid imagery and symbolism allowed her to explore and express the darker aspects of her life and creating that art resonated deeply with many people. So they were able to kind of access their shadow side through that as well and kind of be moved by it, provoked by it. Um, emotionally moved by it. I think there was things like uh, the two Frieders and the broken column, they're quite profound expressions of uh, her own inner turmoil and physical pain. Uh, if you move into the realms of music, I mean, a, a kind of a really relevant one, someone who caused a, a massive uh, splash would be like Eminem. All of that vitriol, all of that anger, all of that frustration, all of that struggle, all of uh, the inner anger, rage, angst, you know, comes out in his music. Kurt Cobain from Nirvana was another one. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, there's been writers as well, you know, like Hemingway. Dostoevsky was another one, you know. this All of this exploring the darker aspects of the human psyche, and in doing so, healing themselves to a point and through their own creativity and this expression of uh, the repressed um, shadow side. So some techniques for shadow integration in art, if you're interested, which can help you tap into your own shadow side, would be free writing, which Jung was a big fan of, stems away from Freud. It involves letting your thoughts flow without censorship. And I often say this to clients, you know, use a monkey mind journal or this kind of free writing. Don't censor, don't try and get it correct. Don't try and express yourself in a way that's uh, maybe socially acceptable. Let it go. Let it flow, let the, let the unconscious, let the subconscious do the work and express itself. It's, it's reveal, it re will reveal hidden aspects of your psyche. It also gives a voice for unlived parts of self. So for instance, an unlived part of self, say perhaps you suppress your anger quite a lot because of certain situations and you have to suppress it. This gives it an expression which means it's not going to come out sideways somewhere else in your life. Like, I don't know, maybe in the supermarket, someone bumps you with a trolley and the next thing, you know, you've got your yeah, hands around their throat and you're like, Rah! and they're kind of thinking, what on earth's going on? And you then move into, you know, guilt, remorse and feeling shameful for your actions. And it's been a build up of the shadow because that's something uh, Jung talked about quite a lot. The unlived part of self, that which we relegate, will build up in power behind us. And eventually, if we don't give it an outlet, if we don't give it a voice, it consumes us, it consumes the psyche, washes over us like a, like a tsunami, and then can do untold amounts of damage and influence our behavior in a way which we wouldn't normally behave. And if we'd given it an outlet, um, perhaps, uh, it, it, well, it definitely wouldn't have built up in power. I mean, I think a, a good one, example of that is anger, martial arts boxing, some kind of contact sport. It allows focus for that anger, it allows channeling of it, and then it's not gonna come out at someone in the street or someone at home in the family, you know, shouting at the kids, things like that. But anyway, back to free writing. So maybe you could set yourself, I don't know, a time, 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and write continuously uh, without worrying about the grammar or whether or not it's coherent, um, how neat your handwriting is, anything like that. 
and it, help, it will help you access your subconscious thoughts and feelings. So you can write about your fears, your desires, your unresolved conflicts. You can do this without judgment and you can, like I said, just begin to express yourself. Maybe you can let out your anger, your rage, or you're even in your inner poet and express sadness and things like that through your own poetry. It's, it, no one has to see it. You could try abstract painting. This um, often encourages uh, the expression of emotions through color and form. I use this in the room a lot. And again, bypass your rational thought. Use colors and shapes to represent your emotions and your inner experiences. Trust your intuition, you know, look at the color range in front of you, pick a color that feels right. Let the hand do the movements, let the unconscious take over. Doesn't matter if it's a squiggle, doesn't matter if it's a doodle, doesn't matter if it's a beautiful landscape. It's, it's allowing that freedom of flow without that conscious restriction. And it allows you to explore and express feelings that might be difficult to articulate verbally. Um, so for instance, people use dark colors, bold strokes to represent anger or frustration. Maybe you can note, uh, if you wanna take it one step further or you're going to art therapy, you will note uh, how different colors are used to express different things, the distances, the sizes, all of these things can give you an insight into maybe, uh, I think it was Jung said, you know, the, the, the insight uh, you gain from the inner world gives you uh, an insight into how you're reacting in your external world and perhaps why. Another one slightly off the wall um, would be dream journaling. Keep a journal by your bed, write down your dreams as soon as you wake up because dreams are often symbolic. Again, it's image based um, and they often contain symbols and themes from the unconscious mind, which provide valuable insights for shadow work. Analyze your dreams to un uncover hidden fears, desires, maybe unresolved issues or unlived wishes. I would be strongly against uh, buying yourself a dream uh, dictionary because the symbology in there, and again, if you study anything by Jung and, and many people after him, dream symbology is subjective. It's gonna be symbolic to you. So what, for, for instance, the color blue represents to one person, uh, isn't the same for another person, you know, and again, the, it's an expression of the psyche. The, the dream is the expression of the psyche. So if you dream of a snake, which is blue, it's, it's well, what do snakes mean for you? What, what, what emotions do they evoke? What does blue mean for you? What do you associate it with? And then maybe the dream narrative as well. I'll do a video on dreams, I think. But the dream narrative, the story outplay, uh, the story play, uh, the story outline, what happens in the dream? You know, the snake chases this and then this happens and then a tree jumps in the way. It's all relevant, it's all um, symbolic. What do each of these elements mean, represent to you? And how is their interplay? And you'll tend to find there's this kind of uh, overlap into your real external world and it'll help you understand how you maybe are functioning and why you're functioning a certain way or reacting or behaving in a certain way. Other techniques you can use are meditation and visualization. So there's, I mean, there's a ton of guided meditations out on YouTube and various other platforms which focus on exploring the shadow self. You could visualize meeting your shadow in a safe space and have a dialogue with it. I think Jung talked about meeting the shadow um, in dreams and having dialogue with it in kind of lucid states. Uh, and this can help you understand and integrate these repressed aspects of self. And you could do this with a therapist as well. You could do it with things like empty chair technique, which is a gestalt technique. But they all, again, help you integrate aspects of the shadow because if they're not integrated, they're gonna influence our behavior when we least expect. And they're gonna create this kind of, not misery, but for instance, if there is an unlived part of you which is desperate to get out, you know, an unlived artist, an unlived, I don't know, whatever, uh, singer, writer, uh, carpenter, uh, boss, whatever, if it's unlived, it's, it's just gonna sit there and fester and it'll always feel like nothing's quite fulfilling. So again, these visualizations, meditations can help you meet with this and maybe help you integrate it. Going back to the art, art therapy, working with an art therapist can provide, like I said, this kind of structured exercise and somebody else looking in at your world, your inner world, with this kind of wonder and point, what's that, what's that, how come this, how come that? Did you notice you did this? Did you notice these two are here and those two are very close together? Fun to do, it's, it's great for self-awareness, it's interesting to do and it can be hugely healing and beneficial. So these are some exercises that you can regularly try to start your journey of shadow integration, set aside some time each day or during the week 
to engage in these practices and reflect on your own progress. Uh, consistency is key to making significant strides in understanding and integrating your shadow. It can help you within your relationships as well. You know, often we project our shadow side out in a relationship. So, oh, uh, I, I really need rescuing. But what I'll do is I'll look for someone who can um, rescue me rather than realizing that you can rescue yourself. So you project it out onto someone else. And you'll probably find in your shadow work, there's someone who's very quite strong inside you. You just haven't been allowed to let it out. You haven't given yourself permission. And that might come from the past uh, because maybe that's too egotistical to save yourself uh, or put yourself center of the world. I mean, it's a very basic example. But um, I, again, I think I'll put a video up here at some point uh, to do with shadow projections in relationships to help you kind of understand that. And of course, if you're projecting out onto someone and they're projecting their shadow onto you, this then it kind of locks in a way. And it's fine as long as you're both projecting. When one of you starts to take that projection of shadow back and integrate it into the self, the other person's left going, oh, I don't know what to do now. And then a relationship tends to disintegrate. Jung considered healthy kind of way to be would be to integrate these aspects of self all aspects of self which are in opposition, stop projecting them out, stop looking for someone to rescue you, stop trying to be the rescuer. And I mean, like I said, they're quite basic archetypes. So if you want to look further, look into archetypal stuff as well, because it will show you, it can demonstrate uh, how you may well be behaving and interacting, it gives you more insight for a healthy, he called it individuation, this healthy kind of uh, level of, of being, of functionality is to be quite well integrated, functioning well, regulating yourself well, and not needing someone else to complete you, not needing something from the environment to complete you, but then you move into wanting that, but also being able to survive without it because you can do it for yourself. And also then there's the obvious, like I've said, restricting down or reducing the chances of something less desirable coming forward like anger, rage, sadness, something which is unprocessed, pushed away, I don't want to know, you know, the ego's going, we don't want to know, we, we, we can't deal with that, we, we'll lock ourselves off emotionally, we'll push it all away. This is a way of expressing it, which is, especially when it comes to wounded child stuff, if you had a difficult childhood, children act on, they're image-based, they're not cognitively based, it does, the cognition within the brain isn't quite fully on. So this is this kind of, you know, the expression, the creative expression of the adult is an expression of the wounded child. And it's bringing that forth in a way that then processes it within your own soul, within your psyche, in order to bring about more of an equilibrium, uh, you know, a higher level of homeostasis, if you like. So, as I said, creativity is not just fantastic for the shadow side of stuff, but it's great for expressing emotions. It's great for processing situations. It's great for working through your feelings, gaining self-awareness, not letting things build up and get tangled in your head. You get them out on paper, you express it somehow in a way which is creative, more abstract, more heart-based, less heart-based, less cognitive, head-based, um, and it can bring immense amounts of healing. As always, I hope that helps. And again, it's a brief overview, uh, but until next time, please take very good care of yourselves. Adios.